to that mic. Um, how, how long did you say you've been doing this? Well, um, we started in early 2000s, 2001 or two, and we put up maybe five or ten of our 300 standards. And by uh, the middle of that decade, um, we decided to put up all of our standards. And how did it affect your revenue stream? Well, it's hard to tell because we've had changes in the economy that affect the sales of our standards as well. Um, but um, in, generally speaking, we feel it works for us. And I, I just don't have enough of it. But you have, you have seen other, other areas where you're increasing revenue, like training or other manuals that you're selling that you might not have sold? Uh, I'm not sure I can say that. In fact, we have had a very difficult time finding additional revenue sources for an organization like us. I mean, we've always had training and, and other products, but to replace revenue uh, from copyright protected standards is very, very difficult. And I think there's been a certain cavalier attitude on the part of um, Professor Strauss and others, including the, the judge in the Beck decision, who, who, like many people, say, well, this is a new world, um, this is a new internet age, everything should be free, and um, you know, instead of, instead of send, selling your records, go sell t-shirts or, you know, start concertizing. That works for the Grateful Dead. Um, Google has found out ways to make money on the web, but a lot of other um, organizations, a lot of smaller businesses have not found that way. And so we have not offset in, great, in a great amount the, the revenues from our copyright protected sales from other services or products as yet. Um, what I can say is, we have not seen a drop off in revenue of copyright protected sales from the free access that we've provided. And we see opportunities perhaps to increase um, some uh, sales through people coming to our website. That, and that, that's where you guys that's, can come. That's a very important point. You put it online for free and you're still getting the same number of people buying your copy. Well, we've had, we have fewer sales, but I, I don't have those statistics. But, but I'm just saying it's hard to know how much of that is, is attributable to our free access. Um, we're willing, because of our mission, to, to accept that. But it, it's not without consequence. It's just very difficult to, to and how long, identify and if, what the consequences are. If we are. were to tell someone you're going to have to change your business practice, we're going to not incorporate your standards by reference unless you start to make them available for free, from your perspective, how much time would we have to give them to adjust? I mean, from we, we've you... been trying to adjust for 10 years, and, and as I said, we have, not, we have not found ways to significantly offset the revenues if we were to lose our copyrights. In other words, or if we were to make our material available for anyone to download and reproduce and, and sell or, you know, along the lines of, if it were essentially public domain, um, I don't know that we could find alternative models. We, I mean, we, could, we would probably provide standards, but we would probably have to um, uh, do pay for play, um, institute all kinds of other fees, and, um, you know, I think it would have a corrosive effect on, on the kinds of things that we want to do. And if you had to do it all over again, would you have done it in a different way, still, still getting to where you are now? In the sense of relying on copyright would you, protected would sales? You have or? Done it, for example, would you have put them online more slowly to see the effect, or would you have tried to explore other revenue sources before you made them available. You just decided to put them online and put them online? We decided to, to try and we feel like um, it's acceptable to us um, to do that. Okay. But, but, but we, you know, with limitations, we now have a read-only product. Um, it does have limited search capacity. We would like to expand that, but again, we have to gauge that very slowly. It's it took us a number of years before we got to the point where we are. We're five more years down the road. <clears throat> there are new opportunities in terms of what's technically available that we're beginning to explore. But again, we're, we're somewhat slow moving because we're not a, a wealthy organization. We're not profit oriented. So it's going to take us some time. And to answer your questions, I have yeah. no idea. Okay. <laughs> um, have you, have you gotten any feedback from those who do use your information in terms of their reaction to it being made available for free and what, you know, overall what they think, how they use the products, how they use their, your website? Do they use it more than they did in the past for other information, that sort of thing? We've gotten a, a very good response from those people who have taken advantage of it. Um, we have made a lot of efforts to get people to our website in general, so I really can't. Uh, and we see in our future, 
using, to the extent we provide free access, it is one, it, to offset some of, of the, the downside for us is the upside that we can use it to, to drive people to our website. And, and that's something we want to explore how to do that better. Can you, do you have and, any data on whether you have increased your usage? Do you, do you track that on your website? Because that's for, this is yeah. very helpful information. Sure. That's why we're well, I, I, we have, um, you know, we do look at web hits, but we also have had a lot of strategic efforts in other ways to get people on our website. One thing that we have done, and which maybe we could provide some statistics, is that we, um, as I said, about a year, year and a half ago, we sent out a notice to all the um, state level regulators that we could identify, asking them and telling them about our free access and inviting them to link uh, to our website in those jurisdictions that adopt our codes and standards by reference. And we provided a link that uh, would enable us to identify when someone was coming to our site from Alaska or something. So we, we are starting to get some information about how things come through a, a government website to our, our um, our website, and that might be helpful in the future in understanding how our standards are used, um, where we can make the best efforts in, in uh, you know, providing information state by state. So, um, but as yet, that is limited information because not that many jurisdictions are actively telling people more than this isn't an NPA standard. You can get it by contacting an NPA at this address. There are very few now that actually even link to our, our website. Now, you did ask about whether the government would link. We would obviously link to a website where we were incorporating by reference if we were allowed to do that. And we would probably link, among other places, in the rulemaking document mm -hmm. itself when we cited your document. So that, it would be a direct link from anybody reading the rule. And that's exactly the kind of thing that, that I'm uh, proposing is how do we do that in the way that's most useful to the user that will provide information to our users about us and, and, and send them to us. And I have a couple of other quick questions um, since you volunteered first as the SDO. Um, the, the first is, how many secondary or tertiary references do you have of standards that are not owned by NFPA? Well, Scott Cooper uh, alluded to this earlier. We have, in, in any one of our standards, <coughs> at the end there's an annex of all referenced, sub-referenced standards, and they all contain sub-references to other than NFPA standards, I would venture to guess. So do you have uh, end-user license agreements with those SDOs to say we've put this up on the website and to the extent people scroll through our material and see yours or have access to yours, just wanted to let you know. I mean, do you have arrangements with them um, or did you prior to posting um, your standards on, are you on the No. Are the other ones are available for free? Well, no, but, this is, so your, they're, pro they're this not is your problem yeah. in, in, in the sense that we can't address, which is um, we reference other standards the way the government references our standards, that we don't copy them. We just reference them. I see. So, so you we can't click no, on those. If I go to your website, no. I can't click through to a, no. an ASTM or No, a, some ASTM. SDOs, and we may, for all I know, mm -hmm. have some of it, you know, are trying to work together to provide, you know, packages of standards and the That's like. That's helpful but, to know. But mostly, um, and I think for most SDOs, that, that wouldn't be the case, that most of them are just, um, they're not linked anywhere at this point. They're just referenced. And then the second is we addressed this very uh, cursory level this morning about 508 compliance. Uh, I don't know to the extent all of your standards, uh, whether they have a lot of graphical diagram chart type of exhibits and attachments, but have you all addressed um, 508 compliance when you decided to post this stuff for free, or is that not really a big issue for you because it's it, It's textual? only recently come onto our screen. Okay. Um, and I don't know that we are, as someone pointed out, whether we are obligated because of incorporation by reference. Mm -hmm. That said, mm -mm. Um, we would be interested in knowing how to better comply and, and voluntarily comply if, if we, we can do it yeah. uh, in a reasonable way. We have a lot of um, the disabled community that we work with in our standards development process, mm -hmm. and we're very, very committed to that issue. So it's something that maybe we could work with you yeah. to learn more about, but we would be very interested in complying. No, we just wondered if anybody was being proactive, even though it's, yep. you know, our, our obligation. 